Yeah, good morning. So this morning we're talking about uh, polio. Uh, so polio is uh, inflammation of the anterior horn cells uh, in the spinal cord, but also the brainstem nuclei uh, that causes uh, destruction of lower motor neuron units. Uh, it's called, caused by the polio virus, which is a uh, single-stranded RNA virus. There's three types, uh, polio virus 1, 2 and 3, with type 1 being the most common. Uh, there's heterotypic immunity between the um, virus types. So what that means is that exposure to one type of the virus doesn't give complete immunity to all three types. You need to be exposed to all three. Uh, and that has implications in uh, vaccination. Uh, it's fecal oral transmission. Uh, it's only a human reservoir. And the, the damage to the lower motor neuron units is caused uh, through a few ways. Uh, the first is the viral replication uh, and the toxic byproducts that the virus has caused leads to inflammation of the neurons in the surrounding cells. And then, then these become targets for uh, neutrophils and macrophages uh, that results in uh, death of uh, the neuron. So just quickly epidemiology of it. So polio was uh, endemic pretty much worldwide prior to the 1900s. Uh, children were exposed at a very young age, so you know, typically less than six months, and uh, had very few clinical uh, infections. Um, because of the passive immunity that was provided by the mother's early exposure in breast milk, um, the endemics came, the epidemic, sorry, um, came to effect when uh, improved sanitation led to that absence of that early exposure. So then children were being exposed at a later age when they were no longer covered by their mother's passive immunity. So one of the largest epidemics uh, on record is the 1952 epidemic in the USA. They had 58,000 cases of polio. Uh, over 3,000 deaths and then 21,000 um, with residual uh, paralysis. This led to the development of the vaccinations in the 1950s, and I'll come back to that at the end. Uh, it's had lasting and significant medical and cultural changes. Um, the vulvar polio effect and respiratory depression led to uh, the wards of the mechanical ventilators. You can see in these um, pretty typical pictures from the era. Uh, this was the birthplace of ICU. Um, they, they concept of an ICU was born out of these uh, and the first ICU was in Copenhagen. It also led to rehabilitation medicine with these patients obviously having ongoing needs for physio uh, and that was sort of stemmed that field of medicine. Uh, it also led to the disability rights movement in the 1950s, 1960s. There was a large number of post-polio survivors uh, that, that had uh, significant lobbying power uh, and it's also um, led to medical philanthropy. So the polio eradication program is the largest um, combination of private and public um, funding generation. Uh, again, I'll come back to that at the end. So there's there's a few clinical scenarios that can happen uh, when someone's infected with polio. The vast majority are asymptomatic uh, and it comes to no effect. There's those that have the minor Ill, illness uh, and this is about a 10 day um, course of a viremia with a pyrexia and arthralgias and myalgias. Uh, there is an aseptic meningitis. Uh, this tends to be a self-limiting condition with no uh, ongoing effects. The paralytic polyomyelitis is the one that we worry about, and this is the, the one that we're seeing the effects of today. So one in 200 patients that are affected with polio have this condition. Uh, it's an asymmetric flaccid paralysis, which distinguishes it from a lot of the other um, clinical conditions uh, that, that, that can affect muscles. Uh, there is variable recovery. Uh, and the mortality rates are uh, interesting in that the younger you get it, the lower the rate of mortality. Uh, if you have a look at the table over on the side, um, you can see it's broken down into um, paralytic polymyelitis, broken down into spinal polio, which is those that affect the lower motor neurons controlling the limbs, um, bulbar spinal that affects both the spinal and the uh, brainstem nuclei, and then the bulbar polio. And these are the guys that tend to have trouble with uh, the respiratory drive and chronic nerve. Um, paralysis. So that's where the mortality rate comes in. So paralytic polyomyelitis, it develops uh, usually in the first week after um, a fever, and fever starts, it's usually the first sign, um, and the paralysis develops over the next two to three days. There's preferential destruction of the motor neurons with relative sparing or sparing of the uh, sensory nerves, uh, and the weakness will vary between the muscle groups. The clinical picture depends on which motor neurons are affected, so this can result in quadriplegia, the respiratory failure in those where the phrenic nerve uh, is affected, uh, and those that have the bulbar effects can have problems with dysphagia and dysphonia, uh, which uh, can lead to respiratory compromise through um, problems with, with, with secretions. Uh, 
proximal muscles are affected more so than the distal and the lower limb more so than the upper limb. Uh, there's reduced tone uh, and this is asymmetric and the reflexes are decreased and so the sensory examination is essentially normal. There is a degree of recovery after um, the initial onset of the paralysis. The majority of this is achieved within the first six months but there have been reports of ongoing uh, recovery to some degree up to two years. The problems that result from this is uh, related to muscle imbalance and the resultant um, joint deformities that come from this and I'll come back to that as well. So there's a few theories on how the muscles recover after being affected with polio uh, and sort of the, go through these three mechanisms. So the first is terminal sprouting whereby the surviving motor neurons, um, their axons have a terminal sprouting effect where they um, re-innovate the orphan uh, motor new, um, myofibers uh, and each motor unit can be uh, up to eight times the size of the, the pre-morbid uh, motor unit. The myofibers also go uh, undergo hypertrophy and this is to try and increase the, the function and the strength of that muscle. And there's been reports that normal strength um, can be returned with only 50% of the original motor units. There's also thoughts that the myofibers um, change from a type 2 to a type 1 and this has been shown on uh, muscle biopsy studies. So these type twos being the fast switch into the type ones with the lower, um, with the slower twitch. Post polio syndrome is uh, a clinical entity that we're seeing more so these days, obviously, rather than the acute um, infection, and particularly in Australia. So this is the onset of functional deterioration after a prolonged period of stability. Uh, it affects up to about forty percent of polio survivors, uh, and the symptoms come on between fifteen and forty years after that initial infection. Uh, it's a clinical diagnosis uh, and it's uh, diagnosed by a new progressive uh, muscle weakness and fatigues and myalgias. There's a few theories again as to how this, this comes about. Uh, it was initially thought to be a reactivation of the virus and a new or a second wave essentially of the polio, um, but that's since been disproven. Uh, and the thoughts are that it's failure of these oversized my, uh, motor units um, that are fatiguing over time. Uh, one of the other thoughts is that the normal physiological in muscle strength is exacerbated in already weakened muscles um, and so I guess the aging process is just um, more pronounced in these patients. There's also uh, thought to be uh, a, a influence of disuse wasting so typically uh, these patients that have survived polio have balance and strength problems and so therefore are less active uh, than their counterparts. And so the thought is that, that again, the normal disuse wasting process with age uh, is exacerbated in these patients. Uh, one of the important things is that um, in a lot of literature is this should be a diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, in that you can't assume that uh, a new onset of weakness is related to the polio and other um, entities should be excluded. So diagnosing polio, largely, especially in the acute setting, it's a clinical diagnosis. Uh, where you get an acute flaccid paralysis for preservation of sensation um, and this is preceded by that prodromal illness. Um, lumbar punctures have been performed um, with sampling of the CSF and this is more so that aseptic meningitis uh, and this tends to show a typical uh, meningeal picture. Uh, culturing of the, the virus, um, pharyngeal, that's fecal oral transmission, uh, so pharyngeal secretions and swabs are positive for the first week of the virus uh, and the stool for up to four weeks after. And this positive stool culture, this is the, the route in which it's spread. You can culture the CSF, however, this is, sort of, uh, this is done more so these days with the use of PCRs and things, but it's, it's, not, um, it's not the mainstay of the diagnosis. You can use viral titers, but again, this is uh, largely useless in the acute setting. It's more used to... Um, monitor the convalescent stage. Nerve conduction studies have been done. Um, again, the sensory remains normal. The motor neurons are a normal or mildly slowed conduction uh, with low to normal amplitudes. So the treatment in the acute phase uh, is patient isolation uh, in terms in so as to prevent uh, spreading of it. Um, complete bed rest, and this has come about that they've shown that the harder you work a muscle in that acute phase, the more damage you do. Um, so symptomatic treatment in terms of analgesia and uh, muscle spasm, um, but also um, starting early passive physio to prevent the contractions. During the recovery in the convalescent page, uh, phase, uh, there's increased uh, physiotherapy and strength training uh, and the use of calipers uh, or splinting, uh, not only to prevent contractures but also to allow physio to occur.
This is probably something we're dealing with more these days now is the, the residual paralysis and the effects that it has. So there's largely five types of deformities that can occur. Uh, so isolated muscle weakness without deformity. Um, so this is generally treated with tendon transfers in order to restore function. So an example of this is uh, uh, weakness or paralysis of the opponent's pelusis and using um, the FDS tendon um, to restore opposition in the thumb. Passive, uh, the other is passive uh, correctable deformity. Uh, so these are generally treated with splinting uh, and these may require tendon transfers. And this is to, th there's two ways that this can be achieved. This is either to um, permanently correct an imbalance in order to prevent further um, uh, deformities occurring um, or to provide a tenodesis in order to overcome gravity. I'll come back to these in a bit more, in de more detail. Uh, there's also fixed deformities, and so the principles here are to restore alignment uh, in the joint and in the bone, um, but also to stabilise the joint. Uh, and it's important to remember that some of these deformities can be compensatory, such as the equinus uh, deformity in the foot, in order to allow standing and walking um, following uh, back knee. Uh, you can also have flail joints, and these develop after a balance paralysis, uh, whereby without any uh, muscle pull or tone, there's no ongoing bony deformity. Uh, however, it's, it's a difficult joint to manage, um, so these are typically splinted or arthrodesed. The other consideration is that the vast majority of patients affected by acute polio um, are those less than five, and so it has lasting effects on the growing skeleton um, because you look, use that normal uh, muscle tone and activity, uh, which obviously provides feedback for a, a growing bone. Uh, these are typically treated with orthoses or epiphysiodeses um, in terms of leg length discrepancies. So going to sort of more specific deformities, the trunk deformities um, such as the spine are usually due to pelvic affliction, uh, and the majority of these are driven from hip pathologies and contraction, uh, abduction contractures. Uh, the scoliosis is generally a long C curve. This is probably not the best picture to uh, demonstrate that, and that develops from a um, imbalance in the trunk muscles. So the treatment is, is uh, by correcting the cause. So generally it's the hip abduction correction, uh, which is through division of ITB, uh, and depending on other contractures, uh, anterior capsule release. Uh, and the scoliosis is typically treated by fusion. In terms of the hip deformities, these are, are really quite complex. Um, and the gradual development um, of muscle imbalance can lead to subluxation. Uh, of the hip joint, particularly again in that growing skeleton, and there can be lasting effects um, on the hip joint. So the proximal femora um, have increased antiversion and drift into coxa valga, uh, and there can be can be underdevelopment of the acetabulum. So all of these um, components need to be addressed um, when treating these patients in correcting the soft tissue balance, contractures, and then uh, various osteotomies, depending on. Um, exactly what the patient has. The most common deformity in the hip is the fixed flexion deformity, and this is that frog leg appearance where they have uh, flexion, abduction, and external rotation. Uh, and this is typically due to contracture in uh, the iliotibial band and also the hip flexors. Uh, so this is treated by releasing these structures, uh, and there is a description of uh, muscle slides so transferring um, the line of pull or the salts over to the greater trochanter uh, so that you don't get that, uh, that flexion contracture. Uh, in terms of knee deformities, there's a few things that can occur. Uh, there is uh, well-described uh, instability or the flail knee, um, and this results, as we said earlier, from balance paralysis uh, and, and weakness of the uh, extensor mechanism. So these are generally treated uh, with knee ankle foot orthoses or calipers uh, or arthrodeses. Uh, the, one of the, the typical um, presentations is this back knee appearance that this young girl has. Um, and so this is a, uh, an adaptive posture following our quads weakness, uh, whereby hyperextending the knee allows that locking. Over time, this stretches out the posterior structures uh, and develops a fixed equinus in the foot uh, in order to get that plantar grade, um, or relative plantar grade. Uh, so the treatment for this um, is uh, quite often involves uh, bony correction, um, and they describe the supracondylar flexion osteotomy. Um, or tenodesis um, of the capsule or hamstrings. In fixed flexion deformities of the knee, um, these are generally due to uh, tight ITB um, and quads weakness. Uh, 
Uh, so these can be treated by division of the hamstrings or transferring the hamstring um, to the quadriceps to reinforce it. Um, or there's described bony procedures uh, such as a supracondylar extension osteotomy. The foot and ankle deformities are, are quite complex and uh, I think it's important to remember that they're progressive too. So they need a, a, a treatment option tailored to that particular patient. The most common uh, is the foot drop and this is due to uh, tib and weakness. Uh, and this develops an equino, equino valgus deformity um, with resultant clawing of the toes. So the treatment of this initially is uh, an AFO uh, and then uh, in terms of soft tissue procedures, the first thing to do is get the foot plantar grade and this can be achieved through uh, serial casting uh, and Achilles lengthening, I should say this is in those that are correctable still, um, and tendon transfers. So they talk about uh, using the perineal muscles uh, in order to, to reinforce uh, tibialis anterior. There's also quite often um, incorrigible deformities that require osteotomies um, and obviously this is done at the level of the affected joint. Uh, the, the foot deformities do evolve over time and uh, depending on which muscles and where the imbalance lies depends on which deformity occurs. Uh, so they can be cavaverous, cavavalgus depending on, on what's affected and these more often than not require a combination of both bony and soft tissue procedures um, or osteotomies uh, to fix those deformities. Uh, and there's description of fusion for the flail joints. So I think the most common being a uh, subtalar arthrodesis or a triple fusion in order to get that uh, correct that equinus. The upper limb uh, deformities uh, and the treatment for them are generally aimed at restoring function. Uh, so in the, delt uh, in the shoulder, the deltoid muscle is the most commonly described and this is treated with a glenohumeral joint uh, fusion. Uh, so these uh, patients are fused in a position of 50 degrees AB duction uh, with 25 degrees flexion uh, and appropriate adductor release. This is a picture of a, a young fellow that's had that done. In terms of the elbow, uh, restoration of flexion can be achieved. Um, I found two described techniques. Uh, the first is proximalizing the common flex origin on the humerus and this is to improve that mechanical lever arm um, for flexion. Uh, and the other is a pec major transfer um, to the biceps tendon. Pronation can be restored using um, flexocarpi ulnaris and transferring it uh, volally uh, to the radial border. And uh, conversely, supination can be achieved by taking the FCU uh, tendon dorsally uh, to the distal radius. The wrist is generally treated uh, with an arthrodesis, uh, and this is to provide that stable platform to then use the remaining. Uh, functional muscles um, as selective tendon transfers to restore finger movement flexion. Uh, thumb, as we said earlier, the most common uh, affected here is uh, disruption to opponent's pollutus, and this can be restored by using the, the fourth or the ring finger slip of FDS um, and transferring this to the base of the first metacarpal. In looking at arthroplasty in um, patients that have had polio, there was surprisingly very little published data on this. Um, I found several very small case series of patients of sort of 10 to 15 joints. There was no, um, no large study. These are perhaps the two main ones um, uh, that I found. So Hoskiller in 2007, this was presented at a JOS meeting, um, prospectively followed 500 post-polio or patients, polio survivors over a 15 year period. And out of this 500, only nine needed a total hip and only 10 needed a total knee done. Uh, and they reported um, excellent results in terms of um, pain and function scores. Um, and interestingly, they had no result in instability. And I think this is uh, uh, not in line with perhaps other studies that I've found. So this other one in Giori, um, published in JVJS in 2002, this was a retrospective review. And they only had a relatively short term follow up. But in their two years, of the, um, the, t the 16 total knees that they replaced in 15 patients, they had four cases of recurrent uh, instability, two periprosthetic fractures, uh, a perineal pal nerve palsy related to correction of a significant valgus deformity and an avulsion of patella tendon. So this is quickly a, a table taken from their study. Uh, and there's a few things to, to notice, I guess. So there's a large number of complications uh, for the number of patients they had. I think their follow-up is not 
very much the short term. But if you look at the, the order of the cases and the prostheses used, there was a significant trend towards, uh, and the authors recognised that they drifted towards using more constrained prostheses um, because of their early uh, instability problems. Uh, and so this is sort of some of the recommendations and the, uh, I suppose, the acknowledgements that these, these authors had. So the difficulties they found was it was poor bone quality. And this is, again, that, that disuse osteopenia and things from uh, a lifetime of uh, poor mobility. Uh, they highlighted the importance of a soft tissue balance at the time of the procedure um, in terms of uh, muscle balances. They had significant problems with ligament laxity, um, again, because of uh, a lifetime of joint deformities. Um, Patella Baha made they, uh, the exposure quite difficult, they commented. Um, and they found that even those patients that were well balanced after the initial surgery, e surgery sorry, even in that short two year follow up, there was a recurrence of this uh, hyperextension despite the use of their constrained and their posterior stabilised prostheses. Um, so they recommended in their discussion at the end that uh, although it's possible and there are good results. Uh, in published in studies that uh, uh, arthrodesis is perhaps the preferred method or using a more constrained prosthesis such as the hinge knee replacement. Um, and then if you are going to do a primary knee that's a, uh, using the, the more constrained is, is the better way to go. So just quickly going through just those, trying to summarise I guess those, those treatment principles. The first thing is to prevent deformity and this is achieved through physiotherapy and splinting stabilising flail joints, and this can be done through tenodesis, arthrodesis, or again splinting. Um, balancing the imbalance, so through tendon releases, tendon lengthening and tendon transfers. Uh, I should say too, one of the difficulties with tendon transfers is obviously um, when transferring a tendon just in any other patient, you lose a great power. So it's hard to have hard and fast rules of, in this situation, do this thing, because you need to assess the patient and work out what tendons they have and through the use of muscle charts work out which ones will be appropriate so that once they're transferred they still have uh, usable strength. Uh, so the recommendations have been to use tendons that have at least a 5 or a 4 grade of power uh, that anything less than this uh, will result in failure. Uh, correcting deformities, uh, so these fixed bony deformities, these can be achieved through osteotomies, arthrodesis and orthoses to some degree um, and ultimately to improve functional ability, um, so preventing um, the predic muscles uh, from overstretching or augmenting uh, the action of weak muscles such as tendon transfers from the hamstrings to the quads. In just general considerations, a lot of the articles talk about uh, these patients being difficult not just in their, their, in their surgery but also in the recovery phase. So they take a long time to heal and this is related to poor vascularity. They have prolonged recovery time, um, increased length of stay in hospitals uh, due to mobility problems, uh, and they quite often need uh, uh, gait aids. Uh, the anaesthetic considerations is that uh, regional is preferred to general anaesthetic, uh, and that polio muscles are effect, uh, more susceptible uh, to muscle relaxants, so this needs to be considered. Uh, and these patients should be followed closely perioperatively because they're at increased risk of. Uh, apneic events and airway compromise, again related to that, those weak muscles. So I'll just talk quickly about uh, vaccination, um, trying to end on a more positive note, I guess. So this was developed in the 1950s, um, and the first was the oral poliovirus vaccine. This is an attenuated poliovirus. Uh, it's the preferred method, method in developing countries, and this is related to the cost. I think it's 11 cents a dose, 11 US cents per dose. Um, the ease of administration, so most of these patients in the developed countries are being treated by volunteers, not necessarily medical staff, so obviously the oral is preferred over uh, intramuscular injection. There is transmission of the vaccine too, which is uh, uh, quite nice, uh, in that patients that receive the vaccine shed it as they would normally a, a wild type virus, uh, so that helps develop a herd immunity. The downside of the oral vaccine is this uh, vaccine associated paralytic poliomyelitis. Um, so as this is an attenuated poliovirus, there is a chance of a reactivation and acute infection from the vaccine. Uh, so this has been, the instance of this is one in 900,000 um, for the first dose of the oral, oral vaccine. Um, they require three doses, I should have said, sorry, um, for seroconversion. 
uh, or two in a thousand cases of those uh, with B cell immunodeficiency. So this is considered a contraindication to using the oral vaccine uh, in this patient population. The inactivated poliovirus vaccine uh, is what we use in Australia, uh, in America. Uh, and this is an intramuscular injection. This also requires three doses. Uh, this is, you get seroconversion in 93% of patients after two doses, uh, and then 100% uh, following three doses. Uh, so I said also at the start that there's a little heterotypic immunity between the three strains. Uh, so each of these vaccines are available in a single form or a triple form because you need to expose patients to all three types in order to get that complete immunity. So the polio eradication program, this, uh, this is a, a great success, I suppose, with modern medicine. Uh, so in 1988, the World Health Assembly uh, resolved to eradicate polio, and this was off the back of the smallpox eradication in 1980. Uh, so this is a combined project from um, the World Health Organization, Rotary International, US CDC, UNICEF, uh, and then the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have been big sponsors. There's been 20 million volunteers worldwide providing these vaccines, and they've immunised over 2.5 billion children. Um, so since the introduction of this program in 1998, there's been a 99% decrease worldwide of uh, acute polio infections. In 1988, there were 350,000 cases in 125 endemic countries, uh, and then in 2012, this has been reduced to a reported 223 cases worldwide and only three endemic countries remaining, which I think is pretty amazing. Um, type, two polios, pol type 2 polio virus uh, was certified eradicated in 1999, uh, and there's just in these three countries now uh, type 1 and type 3 remaining. So, this is, uh, I got this from the, the World Health Organization website, just showing, I suppose, more current data. So globally this year there's only been 26 cases and these have all been in endemic regions. Uh, if you have a look back in 2012, these three cases in non-endemic countries were all imported cases. Um, so patients that have moved from an endemic region um, to a, a cleared region. Uh, and this is uh, again showing just the cases that have been um, reported this year. So polio uh, in Australia, we, the Western Pacific region was, can, was certified polio free in uh, 2000. The peak incidence was in 1938 where we had 39.1 cases per 100,000 pe um, patient population. Uh, we had significant epidemics in uh, 1956 and 1961. The last confirmed case of wild polio was in 2007 and 1977. Uh, and these were both imported cases from uh, Turkey and Pakistan. Uh, and we've had two cases of the vaccine-associated paralytic polio in 1986 and 1995. This is when we then changed to the, uh, the inactivated polio virus, the injection. So this is uh, not something we see these days. The uh, vaccination schedule in Australia is that uh, the recommendation is that uh, children are uh, immunised at the two, four and six months uh, and then get a booster at four years. And so this is included in the schedule with other um, other vaccines um, at that time. So I just got a reminder there to Dave that his baby's due. Uh, and also for um, the, uh, the adult population, it's recommended uh, in the American literature that adults get a once-off booster um, in order to confer lifelong immunity. Um, however, in the Australian um, immunisation handbook, they recommend 10 yearly booster uh, and that this should be done for high-risk pet workers. Uh, and that this should be done in conjunction with uh, tetanus boosters, uh, as a reminder. So I thought that was interesting because it's not something I've seen before of a booster. And of course, FDR was probably the most famous polio as well.